Hey everybody, my name is Ed Friedman. Thanks for coming. If you want to fill in, like move up a little bit, you're welcome to do that. Um, um, a lot of new faces here. Um, I chair Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. We have a new executive director, Aaron Macro, right back there. Um, one of the sponsors, or a deep prime sponsor of our series, which we've been doing over 20 years, is Patagonia down in Freeport. So we are a unique organization in the state and even all around in that we are not we are a land trust, but we're not just a land trust. We do some really cutting edge research, including over the years some uh, caged mussels, use of caged mussels to monitor whether the paper mills are still discharging dioxins, locate PCB hotspots. Um, we've just done another round of um, using aerial photography and geographic information systems to uh, look at land use and aquatic vegetation changes over time. We have a time series going back to 1956 in the area. Um, we, um, so we do active research, we do archaeology, uh, we just protected, so a mix of research and land trust. The most significant prehistoric site in the state of Maine, which is up on the Kennebec River in Dresden, called Dresden Falls. Um, we have a very active education program. We go into the mostly elementary schools, but all the schools, and we talk about the bay, and we talk about the different critters that live here. We talk about adaptations, evolution, things like that. And we are very strong advocates, uh, largely around fish passage, but also around issues around toxics, working on the issue of uh, wireless proliferation. There's a lot of young people in the room. I'm sure you all have <coughs> cell phones with you. But uh, I've been doing this for probably 50 years. And I consider the wireless proliferation issues uh, emitting radio frequency radiation to be probably the most significant toxics issue of our time. Not good for you, so be careful with your devices, please. Um, so, uh, land conservation research, well, we've protected over 5, uh, 1,400 area, uh, acres of uh, wildlife habitat around the bay, have about a dozen or so easements, conservation easements. And we're always, we work with partners around the state and federal partners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, to do that. So some of the examples are over here. We've got some current newsletters. We'll have some, skip the important part, we'll have some juice and cookies at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the presentation. And much of what we do, almost all of what we do, is due to dedicated volunteers, of which there's a, a couple in this room right now, at least. So if you're interested in volunteering for anything we do, um, Bay Day is a great opportunity twice a year, getting fourth graders out, getting really hands-on, dirty, doing environmental education around the Bay. It's just a day full of great energy. Uh, we do in-school in classroom visits during the year. Talk to myself or Aaron, and we can get you set up and plugged into that. So um, if you have friends that couldn't come tonight and are interested in, in uh, Hamish's presentation, um, we are taping it, and with any luck, it'll be available on some of the community cable TV stations as well. So, our speaker tonight, stage for the stage right, so, uh, Hamish, Hamish Grieg, he's a native of New Zealand, and uh, he's an associate professor of stream, uh, stream ecology at University of Maine in Orono. Um, he's got an uh, undergraduate and master's degree from University of Canterbury in New Zealand, in Christchurch. Uh, but yeah, so Hamish spent his, his, his youth um, uh, messing about in streams, looking for you know, aquatic invertebrates, call them bugs, right? And uh, looking for big trout. He's still a big trout fisherman. So um, you haven't grown up, right? No. Yeah, so anyway. Grown up. So uh, uh, he, he did postdoc work, so again, in, uh, uh, in the Rockies and uh, also in New Zealand, and uh, he's been here in Maine since 2013, uh, working with uh, at the university on climate change issues and uh, eutrophication in pond areas. Um, and his research group looks at food webs supporting Atlantic salmon, other fish. We work hard on those issues, migratory fish, and. Uh, uh, Turbine mortality is what we work a lot on from the hydro dams. But um, Hamish is looking at the, the uh, sort of biological aspects that relate to uh, migratory fish and other creatures living in and around the riparian zones. And, and as advertised, tonight's presentation is focusing on the intertidal areas. And I, th I probably called 
Hamish and asked about Jack, and Hamish graci graciously offered to, to do the presentation of this work for us tonight. So thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks very much, Ed, and thanks very much for, for having me and for braving some unseasonal cold to come out. Um, and as Ed suggested, this work is, is very much the, the brainchild and, and effort of my grad student, Jack McLaughlin, um, who's Scottish, and so I thought we'd trade his thick Scottish accent for a thick New Zealand accent, <laughs> so at least you guys could feel like uh, you're talking to someone foreign. Um, so we started working down in Mary Meeting Bay uh, soon after I arrived at um, the University of Maine, and, and Jack was one of my first grad students, and we have a bit, had a bit of an open slate to go explore Maine and explore freshwater habitats that would be interesting to work on, and I never would have thought that I'd be an intertidal ecologist, because I didn't like getting salty, and so this is the perfect world. <laughs> Um, and I thought I would start with some gratuitous work for the New Zealand Tourism Agency because who doesn't want to see photos from New Zealand? Uh, this is where I'm from. Um, there we go. Let's try that. That way. Okay. I just have to do it this way. Okay, we'll do it that way. Anyway, this is where I'm from, Christchurch in New Zealand, which is kind of in the middle of the South Island here. Uh, it's important to note one thing in this picture, the Tasman Sea that separates us from our misfit uncles over there. But I grew up in New Zealand, um, and it's a land of strange customs. Um, some of you will have noticed some of these, like rugby and cricket, which is five times more boring than baseball, but wonderful. Uh, meat pies and lots and lots of sheep, which I'm sure you've heard about. Um, but the other part of New Zealand you would have heard about and what got me interested in freshwater systems to begin with was uh, a bounty of really beautiful rivers, lakes, ponds and wetlands. And so I grew up uh, searching for trout in these environments and thinking about what makes them work um, and that led to a career that took me all over the world and, and ultimately to Maine. Um, and part of the fascination with aquatic insects is they're just really quite beautiful organisms. These are four um, insects from New Zealand. This is our bog standard mayfly that you see in every stream you leave a go in. This is one of the only carnivorous mayflies in the world. Interestingly enough, one of the other ones is found in northern Maine. So there's a connection there. Beautiful green stoneflies, bright sulfur yellow mayflies. It's, they're really wonderful organisms when you get to see them up close. And I grew up as a little kid uh, fascinated in creepy crawlies. So that's me when I was about my daughter's age. I think I'm about three at that point. And um, I was the kid that would come inside with a bucket full of beetles, let them out on the carpet and play with them, much to my mother's disgust. Um, and that transitioned from just a general interest in the natural world and natural history uh, to thinking about what trout eat. Um, because those of you that have uh, heard about trout fishing in New Zealand will know that it's incredibly famous because the trout are quite literally as long as your leg in some cases. That was just shy of the magical 10 pound mark, but, uh, and its belly is full of aquatic insects. So learning how to catch trout, of course, involves learning a bit about aquatic insects. Uh, this is my hand here with the stomach contents of a you know, fairly good sized brown trout full of helgramites um, that had been feeding on during that day. And so the connection of being interested in creepy crawlies and natural history, wanting to catch more and larger trout, um, got me into thinking about aquatic insects, and then I developed a professional interest in that ever since. So in addition to wanting to catch trout, why would you study aquatic insects? Why are they even interesting? Does anyone have any ideas? I've got plenty, clearly, but... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So they're a, they're a key part of the food chain, and we'll go through that in a little bit. Anything else? Do they fertilize the water? They do. So when they're eating resources like algae, they pee and poop a lot of that out, and that gets picked up by plants um, and other algae, so they can recycle nutrients. Yep. They're indicators of Yeah, they're one of our best indicators of um, pollution and water quality changes, because they integrate their environment over their life cycles, so over a one or two year period, and so they integrate all the stresses that have come through that environment. So they're used by every single state in North America for, bio, for monitoring water quality. Um, they're also weird and wonderful. I mean, this is a, a sort of a snapshot of the various types of body forms of aquatic insects, and you have everything from crazy things with big jaws and big gills to giant beetles to the offspring of those, the larvae of those beetles that are like 
Dracula and that they inject their prey with their big mandibles and suck out the insides. They're fascinating, fascinating organisms. Um, and so that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I get so excited about them. But the other reason uh, that they're really important, as we alluded to over here, is that they form the machinery of what makes ecosystems work. So in the bottom of every freshwater environment you can imagine, including Merrimeeting Bay, is a mix of slimy stuff that's algae, bacteria, and fungi, often mixed up with dead leaves and fine particles of dead leaves. And that forms the base, the resource base, at the bottom of a, a, a stream or a food web. And insects are the things that consume that resource base, mobilize those nutrients into their bodies, put on their own biomass, their own body bait, and then they get eaten by things higher up that most people care more about, like fish and birds. And so they're kind of the linchpin in moving this energy through the system um, and are the ecological machinery that make our ecosystems work, support our fisheries, our waterfowl, and underlie water quality and other things that we care about. And so that brings me to why would we think about freshwater tidal marshes and the, and, the, and the bugs that live within freshwater tidal marshes, which I'll spend the rest of today on. And I didn't even know freshwater tidal marshes were a thing until Jack sort of got interested in, in Mary Meeting Bay and started talking to me about it. Um, and it's, it's really quite a wonderful system that is surprisingly common, even though they might be quite small in their spatial extent or how much um, land they cover. And if you think about your, your standard kind of river trajectory as it flows from the headwaters to the sea, you start up in non-tidal freshwaters, which is your standard river, which I'd spent my life working on. And then it flows out to, through various um, grades of salt until it gets to the marine environment. And so our estuaries are the areas of, of increasing salt concentration as you move out. But nestled within that is a zone where you have tidal fluctuations and entirely freshwater habitat. And most of the large rivers that we have along the eastern coast of North America have some freshwater tidal reach. It's just often quite small. It's just this area where there's a perfect mix of water coming in from the river environment and tide pushing up that creates freshwater tidal conditions. Does anyone know how freshwater tidal conditions even happen? How can we have tides when we have no salt? You talk faster than I can listen. Okay, I can, I can definitely slow down. <laughs> I get excited, you see. So how, how do we even get tides in a freshwater system? That's my question. We get tides because of the moon. Uh -huh. I, I thought you said it had something to do with the salt. It has something to do with the salt, yes. Okay. Is it like a damming effect on the tide? Is yeah. So what's happening is there's two things going on, right? So there is a, the fact that fresh water is lighter than salt water. It's less dense, so it floats on top. And so when you have a tide coming in and there's enough fresh water pushing against it, the tide will go underneath, the marine tide will go underneath and push up the fresh water out into the marshes adjacent to the river. So it kind of pushes underneath and the fresh water goes up and out into the adjacent marshes. And then when the, t the marine tide retracts, that fresh water falls back down into the river. And so it expands and contracts over the course of twice a day and you get entirely freshwater system, no salt whatsoever, but you have these tidal fluctuations like you would at the beach or on a rocky shore. And this only happens when there's enough freshwater flow to resist the incoming uh, salt. And Merrimini Bay is one of the greatest examples of that um, because of the constriction at the Narrows. And so if you look at where tidal freshwaters are across New England, each of these blue stars is a um, known, well-described tidal freshwater habitat. Um, most of these are relatively small. They're a section of maybe 100, 200, 300 yards of river um, that has a tidal freshwater marsh. But nested in the middle of this, where we are, and what you know better than I do, is the Merrimeeting Bay, this really large extent. And it's one of the largest extents of freshwater tidal marsh, certainly in North America, and it's, it's also um, important globally as well. So it's a wonderful place to have on your doorstep, and. And I think it's a, um, it's a wonderful thing that this organization is doing to um, advocate for, for and do research on, the, on this marsh. And so when we think about what tidal freshwaters do for us, other than being wonderful places to take our kayak and fish, 
Um, this is sort of a, a, a wordle, so larger words mean more important, of the things that people associate with freshwater tidal marshes. And this is ecosystem services, so things that the freshwater tidal marsh does for us. Um, and things that come up make a lot of sense. Fisheries, they support every diadromous species we have in the state, comes through Mary Meeting Bay at some point in its life cycle, and often the juveniles spend a lot of time there feeding. Uh, it sequesters carbon. So there's an awful lot of production that happens during the summer as the wild rice grows up and then that retracts down at the end of the season and some of that gets buried within the sediments and it gets locked up. It doesn't go into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. It's great for waterfowl hunting. Tourism's important because it's a lovely place to take a kayak or a boat or to watch over. There's some, uh, some strange things in here. Where is it? Corpses right there. Apparently people used to dispose corpses in the freshwater tidal marshes of the Hudson River just out of New York. So there are, there are many different uses for freshwater tidal marshes. Uh, but when we think about recreation, fisheries, carbon sequestration, water quality, those are the big ones that come to mind. And we know surprisingly little about freshwater tidal marshes. And one of the reasons why we know so little about them particularly for their insects, is they kind of fall in this no man's land of research. So you've all heard of marine biologists, right? Marine biologists are salty characters that like being out in the open ocean or work in estuarine conditions where it's salty and crustaceans and mollusks are the main organisms. And limnologists or freshwater ecologists work in lakes, rivers, ponds and wetlands that are not tidal. And stuck in the middle, how Jack calls it the forgotten cousin of freshwater ecology, are these freshwater tidal marshes that not many people work on because they're kind of outside the purview of freshwater ecologists and they're too fresh for marine ecologists to want to work in. So not a lot of people have done research on them. And the research that has been done is skewed towards a couple of different groups. So people have thought a lot about fishing game within freshwater tidal marshes, and that's the majority of the research that's been done on animals have been done on birds and fish. And that's because people care about them and they bring with them dollars. So, I mean, these are important things. And then there's a lot of work that's been done on the plants of um, freshwater tidal marshes. Um, and Mary Mean Bay has this amazing diversity of aquatic plants. Um, because it's got such a high production, such a high availability of nutrients, and lots of shallow habitat for these plants to grow. So we know a lot about uh, the plants of freshwater tidal marshes, and one of the key reasons why we know a lot about the plants is because they're the main way in which carbon gets sequestered, sucked up out of the atmosphere and buried um, in freshwater tidal marshes. And that's motivated a lot of research because, of course, carbon that's in the ground and not in our atmosphere is not contributing to uh, greenhouse gas problems. And so freshwater tidal marshes have a lot of value in sucking up that carbon. But what connects these things? Well, it's the bugs. And so connecting the processes happening at the bottom of a food web to the things people care about at the top, the waterfowl and the fish, are all the interactions between these freshwater organisms that eat each other and in doing so are transferring energy through the system. And they've had very little study globally and very little study um, nationally um, in freshwater tidal marshes. And studies that have focused on invertebrates in freshwater tidal marshes have tended to focus on large rivers in very heavily modified areas like Connecticut and the New York and New Jersey area. And so they've, ne they've never actually sampled freshwater tidal marshes that have um, some level of, of um, sort of naturalness to them in terms of a lack of human impact. So what we're focusing on in our research, of course, are the bugs, um, because we think they're exciting and, and a really important part of this whole ecosystem. And wetland insects, insects that live in still waters, and including freshwater tidal marshes, are a whole range of different things, um, from beetles that breathe oxygen from the surface of the water, and this is a beetle here bringing down its bubble that it's collected from the water surface. Um, to beetle larvae, to this is the face, the business end of a dragonfly, and they have these big modified mouth parts that break out and snatch prey and bring them in and they chew them up. And you can see this jagged edge of these interlocking fingers that hold on to the prey as they eat them. They're terrifying things. Um, you might have seen back swimmers swimming around. This one's actually up at the surface film of the water, 
sucking in oxygen, and it's going to bring that down with them and go about its, its merry way. And of course, other things that aren't insects are important, like snails. They're the key grazer in the system that are eating the algae that's attached to the stems of plants. Um, scuds or amphipods, same as sand fleas, but aquatic versions, uh, you find in a lot of wetlands and freshwater tidal marshes. And then my personal favorite, caddisflies. They're aquatic moths, essentially, that can secrete silk and use that silk to build a case. And they build a case out of sand grains or out of plant material, and they tow that around with them their entire lives. And that provides protection, and it also provides a place where they can um, create water currents by undulating their abdomen, and that sucks water in, ventilates their gills, and expels it again. So they're really, really cool organisms. And you find all these different animals in wetlands, including freshwater tidal marshes. And if we think about how wetlands work, there's a couple of things that are important. First of all, whether or not a wetland dries. So some wetlands, like vernal pools, which I'm sure you've heard about because they're important habitats for salamanders, dry up, so we consider them temporary. Other wetlands might last an entire year before it dries up, or sometimes maybe get two or three years through without drying up. And then, of course, there are permanent wetlands that never dry up at all. And if we think about what influences the insects that live in these different types of habitats, the first one kind of makes a lot of sense. If you go from habitats that dry to habitats that don't dry, the risk of insects drying up, which for an aquatic insect is a problem, uh, starts to decline. So wetland ecologists think, well, in temporary habitats, drying is the most important thing that influences insects. And that makes a lot of sense, right? As you get more permanent habitats, something else changes. And that is that you get the presence of fish. So in more permanent habitats, predation risk is a more important stress for aquatic insects than drying. And in a large lake, they're not going to dry up. They don't have a desiccation risk, but they do have a big risk of getting eaten. And so you tend to see different types of insects in different habitats. And this will come back to freshwater tidal marshes soon, so don't fret. So things that live in temporary ponds develop very, very quickly. Think mosquitoes. They go through their life cycle in a couple of weeks, really rapidly. They run around like crazy, trying to get as much food as they can because they need to develop quickly before the pond dries up. And they are clueless when it comes to predators. They just get eaten like crazy. If there was a predator there, they have no defenses because they can't afford to have defenses. Whereas things that live in lakes that have fish, they spend two or three years going through the development because there's no rush. They get larger and they forage more cautiously. They're risk sensitive. If they detect the presence of a fish, they'll slow down, catastrophize or retreat into their cases and wait it out for a bit because there's no rush. And they invest a lot of energy in defenses. They build things, they have behaviors for avoiding fish. And that means they can't live in temporary ponds because they can't go through the development fast enough. And temporary pond fauna can't live in permanent ponds because they all get eaten. And we've spent 20, 30, 40 years as ecologists working all this out. And then we start studying freshwater tidal marshes and realize the world is not that simple. Because this is what happens in a freshwater tidal marsh. So the tide comes in, and so do the fish. And those fish, during low tide, are hanging out within the main river. So the Kennebec River, um, or one of the other feeder tributaries in Merrimeeting Bay. And then as the tide comes in, and the water goes up into the marshes, the fish go with it. So bugs that are living in freshwater tidal marshes dry up twice a day, and twice a day they have an influx of hungry fish. So they've got the worst of both worlds. And there are no other systems that I know about that have this problem, that have daily drying and fish coming in with, that dry, with, with the water. Um, and this is really challenging for insects. And so we have no idea well, at least I had no idea when we started the study what types of invertebrates we would see in freshwater tidal marshes and whether we would see different insects at the low marsh that is you know, inundated with water for 9 or 10 hours a day versus the high marsh, which is the equivalent of our high tide zone that might only get water for a couple of hours a day. We literally had no idea. So when we started the study, our research questions were really quite simple. What insects are even in freshwater tidal marshes? Because we really didn't know, and as scientists we really didn't know, because the only ones we had sampled were things like the Hudson River that are kind of a bit screwed up, to be honest. 
Um, and then we didn't know whether those bugs would be different from other types of wetlands adjacent. So ponds, vernal pools, or lakes. So kind of simple questions starting out because this is a really new system uh, for us to be working in. And we were very fortunate to find Swan Island as a place to, to base our study. Um, who's been on the Swan Island before? Yeah, so it's a really amazing place, right? And surrounding Swan Island um, and the lighter color here, which you can see running around the outside, are really nice, expansive tidal freshwater marshes. And we can get to them pretty easily um, by using the infrastructure on the island. And so for those of you that haven't been out there, this is what they look like. So really diverse fields of plants dominated by wild rice. Um, and uh, you know, we have this marsh extending out into the bay and the Kennebec River in this case is to the right um, where the main stem is. And this is what they look like at low tide adjacent to the river. So everything contracts back down and goes back up again. And all this um, habitat develops over a period of a few months. So this photo was taken um, early in the season. So this was in June. And then by mid-July, this is what that area looked like. So huge expanse of wild rice coming up to, you know, in some places, chest height. So a huge amount of habitat available um, to these organisms. And so on the island, uh, we established four different transects out extending from the high tide zone where the marsh met the land out into where the Kennebec River or its, or its side braid was. And so we had two on the Richmond side and then two on the other side. And we chose marshes that differed in their characteristics. So some were short and steep marshes and some were really long expansive ones that took three or four hundred meters to get out to where the low tide zone was. So we captured a lot of this variation. And what we did was run transects because we were really interested in how the habitat and the bugs that live within that habitat change as you move from the high tide zone out into the mid tide zone and then right down to the low tide zone adjacent to the river. And so with the sampling we were able to capture a couple of key different key zones. We had the high tide zone that was inundated for less than two hours a day or three hours a day. So for an aquatic insect, this is not really an easy place to live. All the way down to the low tide zone that had water for you know, 9 or 10 hours on average, um, twice a day. So almost permanent water. And then you, know, you step down a little mud bank and there's the Kennebec River that's always filled with water. But we're also interested to know what other habitats were on the island and what insects were in those. So we sampled four different permanent ponds that were on the island, some of which had fish, some of which didn't. And the ponds look like ponds. Um, so this is one of the larger ones. Um, and they had quite dense um, zones of vegetation coming up around the outside. So they kind of look structurally similar to the, to the freshwater tidal marsh, um, but they are inland and had no tide. And then on the island too are a number of temporary wetlands that are mostly like vernal pools. And we sampled those as well. And those are the blue dots on the map. We had four of those. Uh, one of them had a somewhat sad looking dock in it that was usually high and dry. So these are woodland pools that would, ha uh, that would hold salamanders and wood frogs and other species that you might have heard about. Um, and some of these were really quite small marshy habitats that only lasted about two or three months into the season before they dried up. So these are very different habitats to the permanent ponds. So there are all the study sites together. And well, how do you go and sample insects? Well, really all you do is drag a net around. The technology for sampling insects hasn't changed in three or four hundred years. Uh, you have a net that has one millimeter mesh. Um, it's about a foot wide um, and you sweep it back and forth in a systematic way. So we usually sweep one third of a meter squared. So we stand there, we have a meter stick in front of us, a yard stick, and then we sweep the net back and forth. And then we know that all the insects we've captured have come from a standardized area of about a third of a meter squared. Um, and so we do that sampling within the vegetation, extending out into the, um, the freshwater tidal marsh from the shore. And we did that in May, June, and August to try and capture some of the seasonal variation you might see in the insects um, as the vegetation grows up and as it gets warmer and they go through their own development. And we also put out these nifty little things uh, that are called hobos. Um, and they are water temperature recorders. 
and you secure them to a piece of rebar or a piece of PVC anchored into the substrate and they record water temperature and light every few minutes, however, how often you um, program them. And then you can download all that data at the end of the year and have a full uh, record of how temperature in the water has changed over time. Really useful things. Much easier than going out there with a thermometer every five minutes, which in a tidal system can get kind of dramatic. So with these samples, we spent a lot of time doing this, uh, often at night, staring into white pans of uh, leaves and detritus and other things, picking out bugs. They're so much easier to do alive. So we did all our field sampling in our, in our lab work, essentially, um, in one of the lean-tos at Swan Island camping area. Because um, a moving bug is much easier to see than a dead, not moving bug. Um, and so from that we get uh, macroinvertebrate samples, uh, and this is what one of those looks like. Um, a bunch of bugs uh, from one third of a meter squared, in this case was one of our pond sites on the island. And then we go and identify all these, these organisms to genus using sort of our standard keys and guides. Um, we count them, we measure them so we could work out how much they weigh and do a bunch of analyses. Now, I'm not going to go too much into the hard science. I want to focus more on what we found because I think it's pretty fascinating. So, what's living in a freshwater tidal marsh? Well, lots of things. So we think about the low tide zone, which is right against the river, and has water most of the day. It only is dry for maybe a couple hours each tide. Well, there's a couple of things we found a lot of. A lot of mud snails, and that kind of makes sense since it's a pretty muddy habitat. And these have little trap doors that they, put, that they have inside their shells that close up when it dries out, so they protect themselves. There were lots and lots of midges, non-biting fly larvae um, that crawl around within the fine sediment, the fine silt, and eat particles of organic matter, usually tiny little particles of leaves and things like that. And there were a lot of aquatic worms. They dominated our abundance. Uh, we would find two or three hundred in a sample. Um, and they're really good at doing the same thing they do in gardens, eating um, organic material in this fine sediment. But there were some other really cool critters, especially down at the low tide zone. We found a lot of river species that you would normally associate with flowing water. So this thing here is a net spinning caddisfly that uses its silk to build a little goalpost like, the like soccer, soccer net like um, uh, trap for catching things that they're drifting by in the flow. A wonderful, wonderful species. And then burrowing dragonflies, and we'll talk more about this critter a bit later on. They burrow into the sediment and pounce on hapless coronamids and worms, midges and worms, as they're coming past. As we moved up into the vegetation of the mid-tide mid zone, so this is where the wild rice was a dominant um, vegetation, we started seeing more uh, classical insects. So there were water boatmen that swim around, and they're called water boatmen because they've got long arms, and they move them back and forth like a pair of oars. And they breathe oxygen from the water surface and bring that down with them like a little diver. Really abundant were these little wee mayflies, Canis mayflies, which people that fish are called angler's curse because they're really tiny. You could fit a dozen of them on a penny. Um, and they're really cool because they have um, these plates on the back there, these little round discs that you can see above my finger there, are gills, and underneath those are a number of other gills. And they're like bellows. They move them up and down to bring water and ventilate the gills underneath. And that gives them the ability to live in places that don't have a lot of oxygen, which is like, you know, freshwater tidal marsh right against the silt doesn't have a lot of oxygen. So they do really well. And then we found a lot of amphipods, so these freshwater scuds. And there were a couple of different species, um, and we found them all over the place in pretty much every sample. And they eat everything. They eat dead leaves, they eat particles of dead leaves, they eat algae, and they eat other organisms. So they're kind of a jack-of-all-trades um, thing in these habitats. And as we moved up into the high tide zone, we found a bunch of other things that we didn't find in the low tide zone or the mid tide zone. So who's been bitten by no seams before? <laughs> yeah, there are lots of those in the high tide zone. A couple of different ones, little skinny ones, and short fat ones with little hairs on them. So these are all the larvae of, of these biting midges, no seams. We found a lot of the Canis mayflies, the little wee mayflies. And we found a lot of adult beetles that are scavengers that feed on a whole range of different things, particularly detritus, so pieces of dead leaves, but also carrion and other things. So they were really abundant in the high tide zone, 
and we didn't find them in the low tide zones. And then there were some special things. And these might not look like special things, but trust me, they're really special. So they're aquatic firefly larvae. These are the fireflies that you'll see running around your lawn. There are some species that have aquatic larvae. We found those. We found um, semi-aquatic rove beetles. So these are little scavenging beetles. Uh, we found domestids, which are darkling beetles, and they're famous for being, well, they're the flower beetles that you find in your pantry sometimes, but they're also one of the beetles that colonizes dead carcasses really quickly. So maybe that's why they threw their bodies in the freshwater tidal marshes, who knows. And then this really wonderful organism called the variegated mud-loving beetle. And these are usually found in rocky intertidal areas on the beach. And a lot of these species, these beetles, are usually found in marine intertidal areas. And we were finding them in freshwater intertidal areas. And they haven't really been recorded from those types of habitats before. So, you know, several tens of miles inland, we have these coastal beetles hanging out in freshwater tidal marshes in Swan Island. And what we think is going on is the high tide zone is kind of this little overlap, this nexus of terrestrial things and aquatic things that do well when uh, there's only a short period of inundation. And so there's some really cool habitat there that previously hadn't really been sampled. So when we go back to one of our first questions was, well, are there different insects in freshwater tidal marshes and do they vary across the different zones? Well, yeah, they do. Very different insects are the low tide zone from the mid-tide zone, from the high-tide zone. Even though you can walk from the high-tide zone to the low-tide zone in a matter of a couple of minutes, and that means that a mayfly can swim or walk that distance in a couple of days. Very, very different communities, suggesting there's something going on that separates them from um, each other. So the other question that we had was, well, do the insects that live in the tidal freshwater zones of things like Merrimeaning Bay differ from those that we find in regular ponds and wetlands that don't have tides. So what did we find in the ponds and wetlands of, the, of uh, Swan Island? Well, some of the same things. We found a lot of midges, and you find midges everywhere. They're like the aquatic weeds of um, the freshwater world. You find them in most habitats you'll come across, including sewage treatment ponds. So they get everywhere. But we found these little mayflies. So they were doing well in a range of different habitats, tidal and non-tidal. But one of the things we did notice about the non-tidal wetlands, these ponds and vernal pools, there were a lot more bigger bugs, like large bodied bugs that we didn't find at all in the freshwater tidal marsh, even though the habitat suggested they should be there. So things like the big caddisflies, big dragonfly larvae. This is um, uh, some petrum, and this is its adult here, this like, bright red one that you might have seen flying around the landscape. They're really good at eating mosquitoes, by the way, so they're, they're good things to have around. There were lots of damselfly larvae, closely related to dragonflies, just skinnier and um, daintier, I guess. Uh, and then lots of um, aquatic pill bugs, or isopods, uh, which we didn't find in the freshwater tidal marsh either. So these large-bodied things seem to be, for whatever reason, excluded from the freshwater tidal marsh areas, um, which is, is really interesting to think about as a scientist. All right, I'm going to show you a little bit of data because I can't give a talk without showing a graph or two. But I'm going to walk you through this. So we were interested in whether these patterns that we could see when we were picking the samples and looking at what insects we found, whether they were consistent across all the different samples we took in our four different tidal transects, in our four different permanent ponds, in our four different temporary ponds. So we did an analysis, and I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. We made a graph through, with a technique that I'm not going to go into the details of. But that graph has two axes, like any other graph, and that explains variation in the insects that we found in these habitats. And the graph has points on it, and each point is a community of insects we found in one sample, at one site. So in this case here, this point would be this petri dish of bugs uh, that we found at, at a, in a permanent pond, for example. And points that are close together in this graph, like these two points here, have very similar communities of bugs. And when I say a community of bugs, the terrestrial equivalent would be they're like two red maple forests. Whereas points that are far apart in the graph, this point here and this point way up here, have very different insect communities. So that might be comparing, say, a red maple forest to a spruce forest in terms of the species you find there and their relative abundances. 
And what we can do is we can look at this graph and we can label the points and draw around all the points that came from one particular habitat and compare it to another habitat. So in this case, this is a hypothetical example. Habitat A is nested within the points from habitat B, so they have roughly the same communities. They don't differ much in there. So this could be, say, two different versions of um, red maple forests. But that's not what we found for our freshwater tidal marshes. Here were all the points for our tidal sites. Off on the right-hand side of the graph, and where are the points for the non-tidal marshes going to be? In that big open space. So when we did our analyses, we found very, very different communities, statistically significantly different communities in tidal marshes compared to non-tidal sites. There was almost no overlap. There was just a few species that were shared between the two, but their abundances were very, very different. So we found different stuff in our freshwater tidal marsh from our non-tidal sites. And when we started looking at the different zones, we found that those zones were really different, consistently different. Here's our high tide zone, and all the points that were surveyed, all the sites that were surveyed within the high tide zone fell within this blue shape. All the sites we sampled within the mid tide zone fell within this, fell within this um, yellow shape, and all our low tide zones were down over here. So the low tide zones were very different from the high tide zones, and the mid ones were in the middle, which kind of makes sense. And this is really striking when you think about were the temporary and permanent ponds different? And they weren't. So the difference between a low marsh and a high marsh was substantially greater than the difference between a pond that dries up and one that never dries up. And this just blew our minds because we know from 50 years of ecology that insects and temporary ponds are often very, very different than insects and permanent ponds. But those differences paled into insignificance when we looked at the difference between a low marsh and a high tide marsh. And that's crazy because it's only a couple hundred meters apart and connected by water flow twice a day. So there's something going on that makes insects in freshwater tidal marshes very different in the different zones from each other, even though they could conceivably move between those zones over a matter of minutes or days or months. So what's going on? What might be driving this? Well, we don't know yet, and that's areas of, of, of work for the future, but we think a couple of things are going on. We think that in the low tide zone, down here, that's wet for most of the tidal cycle, and therefore most of the day, there's always fish present. And so insects down there are under really intense fish predation pressure. And so they're not really getting a, a relaxation from fish predation. And there's also very little refuge. This is what the low tide zone looks like. It's sort of an area of, of mud habitat just before the vegetation really gets established. And that's because it gets movement from the river over the course of the season that scours out their vegetation. So there's nowhere to hide unless they, these organisms are burrowing into the sediment. Versus the high tide zone where there's wild rice and other plants are plenty and there's hardly ever any fish predators because they don't get enough time to get up there. And so we think those two combinations of things might be driving the differences in our insects. And there's another thing that's happening, and this is the fact that there's a very big difference in how warm these sites get. So this is what temperature data looks like when you plot it over an entire year. These are two different sites, and this is time from June 28th until August 20th, so a couple of months. The red line is the daily high temperature, the blue line is the daily low temperature, and then this is the average temperature. And so down in our low tide zone, on really hot days, it was getting up to mid 30 degrees centigrade. So that's well into the 80s. And, you know, the same day, the low temperature was somewhere down in the, I guess, 70s. So that was the low tide zone. In the high tide zone, things were getting crazy. Temperatures were getting above 40 degrees regularly. So, you know, mid 90s, getting over 100. And then really, really cold, during the um, low periods at night. And so insects were living in those habitats were having to deal with some ridiculous swing of temperatures where it was really cold or really hot and then really cold again and then really hot and we all know that's kind of challenging. And so we think that stress from temperature and how that differs across the tide zones might be important as well. But for an aquatic insect to be able to cope with, you know, if 20 or 30 degree centigrade shift in temperature over the course of a day is pretty dramatic. 
since they're cold-blooded, their whole body um, and everything that happens within it depends on the temperature around them. So they're not buffered against that change. So it's really fascinating to see that these insects can even persist in these habitats. And then the final question we have was, well, how important are freshwater tidal marshes to the regional diversity? Do they harbour species that are not found anywhere else? Are they important to the biodiversity of, say, the greater Kennebec area? And because we like drawing circles and putting numbers in them, we've kind of worked out the contribution of these different types of habitats to the total diversity of the environment. So these are Venn diagrams. So signs that over, uh, sites that overlap um, are insects that are found within, in this case, these middle ones, temporary ponds, permanent ponds, and freshwater tidal marshes. Whereas ones over here are just freshwater tidal marshes. Ones down here are just permanent ponds. And these are percentages of a total of 107 species that we found during our sampling. So there's a couple of things that we can see um, from this diagram. The first of which is that there are a lot of insects that are found in all three habitat types. They're the generalists. They're the jack of all trades that can be pretty much everywhere. Um, and it's fascinating to work out how they can be everywhere, given that these habitats are all very different in their physical constraints, but also in whether or not they have predators. So that was really cool. But 26 of the species, so roughly a quarter of them, were only found in the tidal freshwater marshes. They weren't found in the permanent ponds and they weren't found in the temporary ponds. And after we adjusted for a few species that you find in the river, we had about 20% of the total pool of insects we found that were only found within the tidal marshes. So they're contributing, they're supporting biodiversity that's not found anywhere else uh, during our sampling. So it suggests that freshwater tidal marshes are really important to maintaining diversity in a system. And that's one of the reasons why we think uh, they're really important to continue protecting. And one of the species that we found is the first time this species has ever been found in this county, and it's a, um, a species of conservation concern, um, and it's also rare across the whole eastern seaboard. And this is this really cool burrowing dragonfly, Stylurus spiniceps, or the arrow clubtail. Um, and this is a really cool bug that we found um, in the marshy areas, in the, in the muddy areas, down at the low marsh zone adjacent to the river. And these dragonflies, they're found from Georgia right up to New Brunswick, but they're hardly ever seen, and we know very little about them, and that's one of the reasons why they're a listed species in the Maine Wildlife Protection Plan because we just don't know anything about them. We don't know their distribution. We don't know their ecology. Um, and here we are finding them in the freshwater tidal marshes of Swan Island, which is just really, really cool. And usually when people survey these and see these dragonflies, they see the adults flying around. Or they see the exuvae left behind as the in um, insects are emerging into an adult. They don't see the larvae themselves. So this was a real find. Uh, and these are really fascinating creatures because they do a few things that other dragonflies don't do. They burrow down into the sediment and they sit there and wait for things to come past before they eat them. So things like um, worms or midges. And one of the features that distinguishes this dragonfly from others that are closely related is its last segment of its abdomen is really long. And the hypothesis for why it's long or the benefit that that could give is that it pokes its bum up through the substrate and it can excrete fecal pellets without having to come out onto the surface of the mud. And if you're in an environment where you've got a bunch of fish swimming above you, not coming out onto the surface of a mud's a pretty good idea. So that may be one of the reasons why they seem to be doing quite well uh, down in these muddy areas. So, um, one of the things that Jack did after he found the species was um, he did a review of all the known um, information on this, this species of dragonfly, what we know, what we don't know. And what he found was an overwhelming amount of information that we don't know for these dragonflies, and that's one of the reasons why they're listed. And I'm just going to, oh, back we go. Some of the basic things about this dragonfly we don't know. We don't know how important tidal freshwater are for this species, and they might do really well in freshwater tidal marshes, or whether their occurrence there was incidental. We know nothing about their ecology in terms of their reproductive ecology and their life cycle. How long their larval duration is, we don't know. We don't know whether they select particular microhabitats within the marsh, either, at the, either during larval development or when they're emerging. 
We do know they can do some really amazing things like crawl hundreds of feet uh, across the marsh to, um, as, as larvae before they emerge as adults. They crawl out on the side of the, the, the marsh, crawl up a plant stem, and then go through the process of splitting open their exoskeleton and the adult flies off. Um, and during that process, when they're crawling up on the plants, they can be really vulnerable to changes in water height. And some of the little research we do have on this species uh, documented uh, large mortality events when um, boats came through and the wake of those boats knocked off the insects as they were climbing up the plant stems. We also know that when they climb out to the edge of the pond or the, the uh, marsh and conditions aren't right and the tide recedes, they go back with it. So they can move around a lot, which is pretty cool. We also know nothing about their larval ecology and what stresses they can handle, be it pollution, drying, predation. And so uh, one of the things we're really excited about with this find on Swan Island is that Merrimeaning Bay could be a place where we could find out this information, where we can collect enough individuals frequently enough to learn a lot about their basic ecology, um, which will help us when thinking about the types of habitats we need to preserve uh, for these really interesting species. And maybe they're an umbrella for the marsh itself, something interesting that might be ecologically important, and certainly the record of it is important for conservation, um, and it can give us another reason, not that we need a reason, but another reason for going out uh, into the marsh and sampling the aquatic insects. So of course I wanted to end by thinking about what are the things that might negatively impact um, these freshwater tidal marshes, particularly around Merrimeaning Bay. And if we think about changes that are happening in our watersheds as you know, human land use gets more intensified, uh, they really are sort of centered upon on these, these types of habitats. So freshwater tidal marshes are likely to be really vulnerable to sea level rise because that really fine-tuned fighting, so to speak, between marine tides coming in and freshwater flow coming down that creates freshwater tidal marshes could be offset by a small change in sea level that might generate saline conditions within a marsh like Merrimeaning Bay. Or alternatively, changes in the timing and availability of freshwater coming in from the surrounding landscape uh, could alter where those freshwater tidal marshes occur. And maybe some of those tidal marshes will become non-tidal in the future. We really don't know, and that would be a really interesting thing to find out. So changes in sea level and river hydrology might influence where we find these tidal marshes on the landscape. Of course, the Merrimeaning Bay is unique in that there are six major rivers coming in, and those six major rivers are draining a huge amount of landscape that's undergoing rapidly intensifying land use. Um, as the greater Portland Brunswick area becomes more um, densely populated um, and as we convert forests to farms or to urban landscapes. Um, and so thinking about watershed scale disturbances is important and the, the vulnerability of these insects to those pollutants um, and how that might affect their ability to transfer energy from the base of the food web up to things like waterfowl and, and fisheries that we might care more about. And of course, uh, wetlands um, in general, and I would imagine freshwater tidal marshes are vulnerable to invasive species, be they animals or plants. Um, and so those are some of the things we might want to keep an eye out for. But I think the overarching thing for me is that we know so little about the ecology of insects in these freshwater tidal marshes that that leaves us vulnerable to making good management decisions, or making poor management decisions, I should say, because we just don't know. Um, and so continuing to work out what insects you find within freshwater tidal marshes, what are some of the environmental gradients that might be important, so what's a stress and what is actually an opportunity for these organisms and how that might change with human development um, is a key thing to start working out. And so um, our research moving forward hopefully is going to start, you know, continue, well, to continue um, to understand these really fascinating organisms, hopefully find some new discoveries of unique taxa that we haven't found elsewhere and learn more about their ecology and why they're there and not other places uh, within the landscape. Mm. And so um, we're hoping to keep working down here and uh, working with a group like this is, is um, a way that we can do that. So we're really excited about it. Mm. So of course there were lots of people that helped. Um, funding agencies, uh, the, the first group of people there are all uh, researchers that helped us in the field collect data. Um, and various collaborators and then various funding agencies. So thank you to all of them. Um, and uh, particularly to Inland Fish and Wildlife, uh, 
and John Pratt, who was really wonderful in, in helping us um, access Swan Island and, and navigate our way and learn a lot more about that place. So, and thanks so much for coming. And I'm happy to answer questions about pretty much anything that you might have. Fresh water tidal marsh or not. Mm -hmm.